Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, studying the importance of being earnest by Oscar Wilde. So uh, this is a trivial comedy for serious people, and uh, for this uh, uh, lesson, I would request all of you to please open your textbooks and start reading with me. So I'll read out the first act of the play. And you need to read on your books with me and uh, I'll be explaining the key terms and uh, I'll be explaining the required text as well. So uh, before going to the text we should know that this is a comedy of manners and there are some characteristics of comedy of manners that we'll be describing uh, in a quick manner. So first of all we have uh, the use of double intenders or other forms of risk language. So this is such a uh, use of language in which uh, there is pun, uh, there is a word that is uh, a word or sentence that is giving two meanings and second meaning is uh, normally uh, not appreciable that is uh, sometimes low standard or uh, uh, non-standard use of language or sometimes it is uh, not worth uh, discussing in good society. So. Uh, and then we have elaborated plots. So plot is very elaborated. It is sometimes creating confusion. Uh, this uh, this uh, confusion created because of uh, inter uh, the characters are intermingled. Uh, this, uh, the thoughts are mixed or uh, uh, they switch the positions. The names of the characters, they create confusion. Uh, they are wearing such dresses which is creating confusion. And then there is physical seduction. Uh, it is a satire, uh, a mild satire on the society. Uh, so the Victorian society is satirized there. Uh, so the, the do's and their habits, uh, the way they are behaving with each other, their lusty nature. So this is very much part of comedy of manners. Extramarital affair is another characteristic of comedy of manner in which we see that a person is having more than one relations. Or for example, if a person is married, then he uh, uh, he or she, uh, they may be having certain extra marital relations too. Cynicism is there, the characters are cynic, they pose in such a way that uh, they keep criticizing uh, whatever is happening and uh, aristocracy is meeting the common folk in this. So aristocracy which uh, normally doesn't mix up with the common folk is seen to be mixing up with the common folk in this play. and. Uh, uh, there are intrigues and uh, spying that is uh, shown in this play that people sometimes uh, or in these plays people are sometimes uh, seen spying on each other or making intrigues to let down each other. Then there is uh, uh, like dresses are uh, worn contradictory because uh, men, men are sometimes shown to be wearing the dresses of women and women are shown to be wearing the dresses of men. So cross-dressing is there, usually women in men's clothing. Uh, then shifting from town to city. So this is important thing which is in this play too, that people are moving from cities to towns, uh, from cities to villages and from villages to towns and from uh, villages to cities. So uh, vice versa it is there. So now coming to the play importance of being earnest we have uh, certain characters. So first of all we have John Worthing, Arjunan uh, Moncrief, uh, Reverend Canon Chosibel, Marion who is butler, Lane is manservant of Algernon, Lady Bracknell is aunt of Algernon. So Algernon is aristocrat but, but he is a dwindling kind of aristocrat. He has lost all the money and mostly he is in debts. So he has to pay money to certain people. Uh, Gwendolyn is uh, the daughter of Lady Brecknell and she is in love with John Worthing. Uh, Cecily Cardew is a ward of John Worthing. She lives in, in the town, in the countryside. And uh, she happens to be liking Algernon Moncrief. And Miss Prism is Cecily Cardio's governess. So she is back in the countryside. So uh, there are certain scenes in the play. So first scene, Act 1, is Algernon 
Moncrief's flat in Half Moon Street. So we begin with first act. Uh, it is morning room in Algernon's flat in Half Moon Street. The room is luxuriously and artistically furnished. The sound of piano is heard in the adjoining room. Lane, the servant, is arranging afternoon tea on the table and after the music has ceased, Algernon enters. Algernon, did you hear what I was playing, Lane? Lane, I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. So, here he's cutting a joke. He's uh, like, uh, he's not interested uh, the way Algernon is playing on piano because Algernon doesn't really know how to play well on piano. So, Algernon says, I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expressions. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my fault. I keep science for life. So one thing we need to notice in this play that uh, certain oxymorons are used and uh, there are certain uh, like uh, the contradictory statements. For example, if uh, uh, the quotation that is very uh, famous that honesty is the best policy. So they may say it like honesty is not the best policy. So there are certain dialogues in comedy of manner, especially in this play that are written in this nature. So coming back to the text, Lane says, Yes, sir, Algernon. And speaking of science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Brecknell? So Lady Brecknell has to visit Algernon with Gwendoline. She likes cucumber sandwiches. So Algernon is making sure whether Lane has prepared them or not. Lane, yes, sir, hands them on a salver. So salver is a kind of tray on which he puts the sandwiches and presents to Algernon. Algernon inspects them, takes two and sits down on the sofa. So now you have to keep in mind that sandwiches were specially made for Lady Brecknell and Algernon has already taken two sandwiches out of them. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night when Lord Sherman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, Eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Lane, yes sir, eight bottles and a pint. Algernon, why is that at a bachelor's establishment the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. So here Algernon is criticizing uh, a taunting Lane because he feels that uh, three of them, Lord Sherman, Worthing and Algernon, they cannot consume eight bottles of champagne in one night. So it must be Lane also who would be involved in that. So Lane, being a servant of Algernon, was also drinking. I attribute it to the superior quality of wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, a champagne is really of a first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralizing as, so, as that? I believe it. It is very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once. And that was in con consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. So he believes that he is having very little experience of marriage since he is married once. So this creates humor. Algernon. I don't know that I am much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Algernon, very natural, I am sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane goes out. Algernon, Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders do not set a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem as a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. So here uh, paradox is used because the examples are not to be set by the lower class. They are to be set up by the upper class. Enter Lane. Mr. Ernest Worthing. So Lane announces that Mr. Ernest Worthing has arrived. Enter Jack. So here we have contradiction that uh, he announces the name of Ernest Worthing, but the person who is entering is referred to as 
Jack, so confusion will be removed soon. Len goes out. Arjunan, how are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to the town? Jack, a player, player. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, LG. So LG is the nickname of Arjunan. So Jack says that uh, it is the pursuit of player that I come to that town for, I come to the city for. So he wants to enjoy his life, that is why he's here. Arjunan, stiffly. I believe it, it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? Jack, sitting down in this, on the sofa, in the country. Country means his village where he lives. Arjunan, why on earth do you do, what on earth do you do there? Jack, pulling off his gloves. When one is in town, one amuses oneself and one, when one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. Arjunan, and who are the people you amuse? Jack, oh, neighbors, neighbors. Arjunan, got nice neighbors in your part of uh, Shropshire. So Shropshire is mentioned here by Arjunan. So Arjunan means to say that uh, he lives there, but Jack is not paying attention that how does Arjunan know that he is living there. So this confusion will be removed very soon. Jack, perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. So first he says that he is there to amuse the neighbors and then he is himself commenting that they are not good people to talk to. Arjun, how immensely you must amuse them. Goes over and takes sandwich. So now Arjunan is taking the third sandwich. By the way, Shropshire is your country, is it not? A. Shropshire. Yes, of course. Hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in so one so young? Who is coming to tea? Arjunan. Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well. But I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. So Aunt Augusta is uh, the real name of Lady Brecknell since she is married to Mr. Brecknell. So she is called Lady Brecknell. Her name is Augusta. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. So here we come to know one thing that there is something between Gwendolyn and Jack. So they are interested in each other. Jack, I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to the town expressively to propose to her. Arjuna, I thought you had come up for player. I call that business. So, Arjunan says that proposing is not something uh, that gives you player. It is all the business because every person has to marry someday. How utterly unromantic you are, Jack comments. Arjunan, I don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love, but there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why? One may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. So, Arjunan is having different views. He says that when you are proposing to someone, that may be a romantic thing, but getting married is not at all romantic. So, Arjunan says, when I get married, I'll be forgetting this fact that there is some romance in wedded life. Jack. I have no doubt about that, dear LG. The divorce court, court was especially invented for the people whose memories are curiously constituted. So he is saying to Arjunan that divorce court is made for, for people like you who are not interested in this subject. Arjunan, oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. So here this is a paradox because we know that marriages are made in heaven. So paradoxes are used in this play. Jack puts, off, puts out his hand to take a sandwich. Arjunan at once interferes. Please, do not, do not touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. Takes one and eats it. So, he is now eating fourth sandwich. 
Jack. Well, you have been eating them all the time. That is a quite different matter. She is my aunt. Take split from below. Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendoline and Gwendoline is devoted to bread and butter. So this is quite humorous in a way that since Augusta is Arjunan's aunt, so he is permitted to eat the sandwiches and since Gwendoline is devoted to Jack, so he is supposed to eat something that he has ordered for Gwendoline. Jack, advancing to table and helping himself. And very good bread and butter it is too. Arjunan, well my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you are going to eat it all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already and I don't think you will ever be. So, uh, Jack, why on earth do you say that, Arjuna? Well, in first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. Oh, that is nonsense. Arjuna, but uh, it isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? Arjunan, my dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin and before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Rings the bell. So he wants to ask him about Cecily, that who Cecily is. Jack, Cecily, what on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Anter Lane. Algernon, uh, bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room that last time he dined here. Lane. Yes, sir. Lane goes out. Jack. Do you mean to say that you have had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you had let me know. I had been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Scotland Yard is uh, a police detective agency in London. A journal. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. So, since, as I told you, that, uh, he was uh, an aristocrat, but uh, an aristocrat who is in debt. So, he is not uh, a flourishing or well-to-do, prosperous aristocrat. He is the dwindling one. So he's, uh, Jack, there is no good offering a large reward now that uh, that thing is found. And to lane the cigarette case on a salver, Arjunan takes it at once, Len goes out, Arjunan, I think it is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say, opens case and examines it. However, it makes no matter for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. So he tells him that the cigarette case that he's having, he it does not belong to him because the inscription in the cigarette case says something else. Of course it's mine moving to him. You have seen with me with it a hundred times and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. So again, this is paradox. There is no harm in reading what is written inside the cigarette case. Yes, it happens in case of a daily diary that you're writing or uh, in your wallet, in your purse. So that is un in uh, ungentlemanly to look into those things. But there is no harm looking into the private cigarette case. So that is just to create humor. Algernon. Oh, it is absolute to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one should not. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't treat. Jack, I'm quite aware of the fact and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't sort of thing one should talk of uh, in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Arjuna. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. The cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Jack, well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be, to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes, charming old lady she is, too. 
lives at Turnbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, LG. Algernon, retreating to back of sofa. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she is your aunt and lives at Turnbridge Wells? Reading. From Little Cecily with her fondest love. Jack, moving to sofa and kneeling upon it. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. This is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. You seem to think that every aunt should be exactly like your aunt. That is absurd. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Follows Algernon round the room. Algernon, yes, but why does your aunt call yourself her uncle? From little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew or uncle? I can't make uh, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. So here the confusion of name is to be solved. Jack. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. Algernon. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answered to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd. You are saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Taking it from the case. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. I'll keep this as a proof if your name is Ernest if you ever attempt to deny it to me. Or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else, puts the card in his pocket. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that doesn't account for the fact that your small aunt, little Cecily, who lives at Turnbridge Wells, calls you a dear uncle. Come, old boy, you had much better have the thing out at once. So, he means to say that it is better for Jack to tell the truth. My dear LG, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Algernon, well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now go on. Tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret bumbriest. And I am quite sure of it now. So, Bumbrist is a term that is invented by Algernon. So, he has invented the term for some purpose. Bumbrist, what on earth do you mean by a Bumbrist? I will reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are earnest in the town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Algernon, here it is. Hands, cigarette case. Now produce your explanation and make pray, make it, make it improbable. Sits on sofa. Jack, my dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me his well guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cicely Cardew. Cicely, who addresses me as an uncle from motives of respect that you couldn't possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. So here we come to know that uh, Jack was uh, uh, adopted by Mr. Old Thomas Cardew and uh, Miss Cicely Cardew happens to be Thomas Cardew's daughter, uh, granddaughter. So now she is a ward, she is in custody of uh, uh, Jack. Uh, and she lives in country with Jack in the same house. Miss Prism is her governess who takes care of Cecily. Coming back to the text. Algernon, where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that th that place is not in Shropshire. <clears throat> Algernon, I suspected that, my dear fellow, but I have bumbreed all over the Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why you are earnest in the town and Jack in the country? Jack. 
My dear LG, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of a guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. As and as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness. In order to get up to the town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest who lives in Albany and gets into the most dreadful scraps. That's my dear LG, is the whole truth, pure and simple. So, here Jack tells his motive. Now, when he is living in the village, in the country, he has his dignity, he has his personality of being an uncle and a warden of a girl. So, there he cannot enjoy his pleasures. So, to enjoy his pleasures of life, he comes to the uh, London city and to make an excuse for his frequent visits to London, he has invented a younger brother named Ernest who is uh, a bad kind of person, an indecent person, a person of a uh, rogue company. So he is often in different troubles. So uh, Jack has to come to London every time to see him. So that is his own excuse. Algernon. <coughs> Truth is really pure and never simple. Moral life would be very tedious if we either and moral literature a complete impossibility. So again this is paradox. Truth is definitely pure and simple. <coughs> that wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your fault my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to the people who haven't been at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you are really a bumbriest. I, I, am quite, I was quite right in saying you, you were a bumbriest. You are the one most advanced bumbriest I know. So here uh, again uh, definitely paradox is used but it is also criticism. Uh, university people are good at criticism or they should be good at criticism uh, because it is their fault, it is their task. So Algernon says that uh, let those people make literary criticism who haven't been to university. So this is a satire. So, uh, so again, uh, Al Jack says that now I am confirmed that you are truly a Bembriest and the most advanced Bembriest. So this term is again creating confusion. What does Bembriest mean? Jack, what on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often you like, I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bambury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bambury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bambury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis tonight, for I have been really engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. Now, the some things to be discussed in this uh, whole paragraph. Algernon uh, now reveals the truth about being uh, Bambriest or what Bambriism is. He says to Jack the way you have invented your younger brother to come up to the town the way you want. So I have invented uh, a sick friend who is in some country, countryside. So I have to go down to the countryside to meet him. He doesn't really exist but to pretend in front of Aunt Augusta, I have to go there because I want to get rid of Aunt Augusta and her company. So uh, that is an excuse for me to go down. So here again, the second thing is going up and going down. That is not a hilly area. Uh, going down means when you are moving away from the center of the society or the main place or main city. And going up means when you are going from uh, some village or country to the uh, main city or when you're going towards the city center so that is going up third thing in this is that Arjunan himself has deduced or made a conclusion that he is invited at Willis tonight uh, although Jack has not uh, invited him Jack I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight I know you are absurdly careless about sending out invitations it is very foolish of you Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. So he is saying something from his own 
uh, he is this is not a, an invitation sent to him by the jack but he is deducing it that he must be invited by jack since he is hard up he doesn't have enough money so he wants to have dinner uh, of, and the burden of that dinner should be shared by jack so you had much better dine with your aunt Augusta, Jack says. Algernon, I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of that kind. To begin with, I dined there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I'm always treated as a member of the family. And she's sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next Mary Fokker, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. This is not very pleasant indeed. It is not very decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husband is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be confirmed Bumbriest, I naturally want to talk to you about membering. I want to tell you the rules. So here he explains such things. He says that I don't want to sit with my relations, like uh, this is something I never uh, appreciate or relatives are not a sort of company uh, whom one should meet daily. And then he says that uh, I am placed next to Ma'am Fakwa who flirts with her own husband. So. Now, uh, for a woman, flirting with her own husband is uh, no big deal, so that is not indecent. But he feels that Fakwa should flirt with him. So he's not happy that uh, she's not uh, flirting with Algernon, rather, she's flirting with her own husband. And then, uh, washing clean linen in public, so washing your dirty linen in public is the main thing. Jack, I'm not a bumbriest at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecil is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bow. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest and I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr. Dash Dash with your invalid friend who has the absurd name. So now here Algernon has uh, like uh, noted this point that Cecily the word is interested in uh, Ernest who really doesn't exist. Arjuna, nothing will induce me to part with Bambri, and if you ever get married, which seems to me ext extremely problematic, and you will be glad to know Bambri, a man who marries without knowing Bambri has very tedious time of it. So this is uh, uh, his experience. He says that one who is, one, uh, any person who is marrying should have a character named Bambri or character to act as Bambri, because a person in a romantic life or in a varied life sometimes he need uh, he needs a break he needs to switch his place he, he needs to get out of the house for some days or for some time so if he or she doesn't have any excuse then going out will be impossible so that is why Arjunan is suggesting him to create a friend like Bambri so that he has uh, or he can go anytime anywhere and uh, the problem or the excuse will always be with him that he has some person to meet so that person may, be no, may not be existing in reality but the existence of such person in imagination or in fancy should be very much with a wedded person that is nonsense if I marry a charming girl like Gwendoline and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry I certainly won't want to know Bambri so Jack denies it he says that if I happen to marry uh, a girl, a charming girl like Gwendoline, I will never like to know any Bimbri because I would love to be with her all the time. Algernon, then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life three is company and two is none. Again, paradox is there. So, uh, in married life uh, or in any uh, relation, two is company and three is none. So, that is the real thing. But he is uh, using it as, uh, as a paradox that in married life three is company and two is none. He is referring to this fact that every person is having extramarital affairs. If you are not having some extramarital affairs, then certainly your wife will.
regardless of the fact that uh, his is to be wife is his cousin too uh, and then uh, jack sententiously that my dear young uh, friend is a series that corrupt french drama has been propounding for the last 50 years algernon yes and that happy english home has proved in half the time so he means to say that uh, such theories are corrupting the dramas jack for heaven's sake don't try to be cynical it's perfectly easy to be cynical my dear fellow it isn't easy to be anything nowadays there's such a lot of beast competition about the sound of an electric bell is heard ah that must be aunt augusta only relatives or creditors ever ring in that wagnerian manner now if i get her out of the way for 10 minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to gwendolyn may i dine with you tonight at willis so algernon again satires uh, satirizes the relatives he says only creditors or relatives they uh, come smashing into the house they give such a knock or such a bell and then he proposes that if he gives or lets uh, jack have enough time to propose to gwendolyn so that uh, jack will take him to dinner at willis tonight i suppose so if you want to yes but you must be serious about it i hate people who are not serious about meals it is so shallow of them enter lane so lane comes and announces lady bracknell and miss fairfax so miss fairfax is title of gwendolyn he announces that both of them have come algernon goes forward to meet them enter lady bracknell and gwendolyn lady bracknell good afternoon dear algernon i hope you are uh, behaving very well algernon i'm feeling very well aunt augusta lady bracknell that's not quite the same thing in fact the two things really go together she sees jack and bows to him with icy coldness because she doesn't know him and she doesn't she since she is aristocratic lady uh, she uh, is off to money and your position so since she is unaware of, uh, about jack so she is behaving in a cold manner arjunan to gwendolyn dear me you're smart gwendolyn i'm always smart am i not mr worthing you're quite perfect miss fairfax gwendolyn i hope i mean uh, i am not that it would leave no room for developments and i intend to develop in many directions gwendolyn and jack sit down together in the corner so this is noticeable that uh, gwendolyn and jack should not be sitting Uh, together like that but since they are in relation they're sitting together and aunt agastra is not approving of this fact lady bracknell i'm sorry we are a little late algernon but i was obliged to call on uh, dear lady harbury i hadn't been there since the poor husband's death i never saw a woman so altered she looks quite 20 years younger and i'll have a cup of tea and those of uh, and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me so now she since she is aristocratic lady and this is a satire a uh, mild satire on aristocratic people too so we are also told about another aristocratic lady who is now widow uh, she was lady harbury so her, after her husband's death she seems quite 20 years younger now this shows that uh, regardless of the fact that her husband has died she is into her makeup and uh, make uh, she is posing to be more younger so her husband's death did not matter her much or she seemed altered in a better way in uh, like we have in our circumstances when husband dies uh, women is supposed to be uh, living a simple life but there we see that uh, she is more fashionable and seems more younger algernon certainly aunt augusta goes over to the table uh, but now since he is there to bring sandwiches the fact is this that his he has already eaten the sandwiches himself a lady bracknell won't you come here and sit here gwendolyn so when lady bracknell notices gwendolyn sitting in the corner with jack she calls her gwendolyn thanks mama i'm quite comfortable where i am <laughs> so this is a remark no a remark of a lady to her mother ab- and when she's sitting in such a position in a corner with a man and when our mother is calling her she says that i am sorry i am very much okay where i am sitting so she prefers sitting with jack so bracknell lady bracknell is noticing this algernon 
picking up empty plate in horror. Good heavens, Lane, where are the, uh, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. Lane, gravely, there were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. So, Lane, since he knows Algernon that he is extravagant and uh, since Lane serves him, so he is taking or he is backing him, he is taking his side by, by uh, uttering a lie that he could not get any sandwiches in the market. No cucumbers? No, sir, not even for ready money. So, the word ready money suggests that since Algernon is on debt, so he is taking vegetables or goods on debt. He is not paying for them. Uh, that not even for the ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you goes out. Algernon. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumber, cucumbers even for the ready money. Lady Bracknell. Uh, it really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me uh, to be living entirely for pleasure now. So, her husband died, but now she seems to be living and enjoying her life. Algernon. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. So, now this is again paradox. Here, uh, no, here is not turned down. Here are not turned down quite gold from grief. They turn white to grey. So, he puts gold in a place of grey. This shows that Harbury dyed her hair in golden, in blonde colour. So, this was her grief that she was exposing to the people. That means she was not grieved at all. She was not sorrowful. Rather, she was happy and she was planning to marry again. Lady Bracknell, it certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, I of course cannot say. Algernon crosses and hands tea. Thank you. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I am going to send you down with Ma Mary Farquhar. She is such a nice woman and so attentive to her husband. It is delightful to watch them. Now, again she is posing the same thing that Algernon just discussed with Jack that uh, uh, Lady Bracknell makes him sit with Lady Farquhar. So, since uh, he is going to Willis tonight to have dinner with Jack, so he is refusing by making an excuse. Algernon, I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. Lady Bracknell, frowning. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to do that. So, now we also come to know from this line that Mr. Brecknell or Lord Brecknell, he was, uh, if he was alone, he was not allowed to come down to the gathering of uh, the guests that were that Lady Brecknell sent or invited in her house. So uh, she was obviously dominant, uh, uh, dominating personality in her house. And Lord Brecknell was a figurehead. He was having no hold on her or on her daughter. Arjunan, it is a great bore. I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me, but the fact is I have just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bembry is very ill again. Exchanges glance with Jack. So, why is exchanging his glances with Jack? So, he is telling him that yes, this is the use of creating a friend. This is the benefit of having Bembry in your life. They seem to think I should be with them. Lady Bracknell. It is very strange. This Mr. Bembry seems to suffer from curiously bad health that he, uh, mostly he remains sick. Yes, poor memory is dreadful invalid. And uh, uh, now you can have the rest of the text in the second video attached here with. Thank you very much. Do watch that video for the complete act one.